Thank you, Mr. President. Um, before I get into my actual points, I want to say a few thank yous at the beginning because I tend to get very passionate and so then I'm going to run out of time. So I get a lot of thank yous at home first. So first and foremost, I want to thank my parents. Uh, I mean, they went to the Dean today, but this is like their first real field today that they're watching. So I'm really proud that they came to see me and I'm very happy to you guys for um, To Mr. President Bora, he has been fabulous. Being president is a hard job. It is rough. <laughs> To Vice President Lily Howard, speaking of hard jobs, she planned this on top of being president of another club and also homework and also just doing all the fabulous things she does. Um, I'm so happy you're in the society, I'm so happy we've gotten closer. Thank you for putting on this wonderful event. It's really great. <laughs> um, to my roommate and very, very close friend Madison, uh, love you, dude. It's been, it's been a good four years. We've had a good time. Um, again, you know, speaking on the same side, that's actually something very not common for us to do. So this is this is really cool. I, it's nice that we get to speak together once. Um, and then to Niall, you're phenomenal. Um, I remember knowing you the beginning of freshman year and just being like, oh my gosh, she's such a wonderful speaker. She's going to do such great things. And I stand by that and I think you're probably well. Um, Alec, you're cool. <laughs> <laughs> we still like this. <laughs> um, to Max, one of my very, very close friends, um, thank you for all of your support, for hearing me cry about Phil all the time. Um, tough stuff, but thank you so much. And to all Phil Nations, past, present, future, uh, I'm so honored to be part of the society. It has been one of the best things I did throughout my time in college. Um, and coming into this role as a woman in a very predominantly male society, uh, has been really challenging, especially when it pertains to doing work in diversity, equity, inclusion, social justice. It has been very challenging, and I'm so grateful to all of you for being there for me and for supporting me along the way. You know, the room is, the room is changing. That's all. We're doing what we need to do, and I hope, that I hope to stay engaged as an alum, and I hope to see um, everybody here go on to do big, big things. Um, so yeah, now to be mean again. <laughs> is standing on. The affirmation is saying that all we have is wording when it comes to law and therefore we should follow it. It will stay static and so we can interpret it in different ways. However, what we have is the wording of the law and to that I say no we don't. Because as I mentioned in my opening keynote, and I really wish we expanded on this more, but hey, I got 15 minutes. Um, the wording is not as we think it is all the time. First of all, a lot of statutes are very vague. A lot of terms of the law are very vague. Also, there's a lot of law that doesn't exist yet. That, by that alone, I believe that you cannot, in good conscience, stand on the affirmation because how are you gonna follow the letter of the law when it doesn't exist or doesn't make sense? That is a really important point to consider here. And, you know, going back to what Member Glass said in the beginning about uh, the don't say gay bill. So, she mentioned how DeSantis doesn't actually explicitly talk about LGBTQ people in that bill, but uh, I had to read the bill uh, because I did a cut law assignment. My professor's here, so I'm not making eye contact. Because <laughs> 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 uh, you know, I don't want to correct me if I'm wrong. But it did address sexual orientation and gender identity. Uh, Definitionally, those are components that relate to the LGBTQ community. So, yes, the letter of the law is kind of expansive in that sense, it's very vague, the terms are very vague, but it is specifically targeting something. The spirit itself manifests as words, it manifests as a statute, it manifests as a bill. And so to completely disregard the spirit of the law and say that the letter of the law is what really tells us something is a completely false equivalence. Like that's just simply not true. You cannot have words without context, you cannot have context without meaning. And somebody brought up on the floor, I believe it was Member Miller, that um, the spirit of the law relates to the intention when it was written. And to that, I firmly disagree. I don't think it's only about the you know, intention when it was written, but the intention when it is carried out. When a police officer is stopping a person on the street for, I don't know, loitering or something, they're not like, well, back in 1892, when this law was made, they were talking about police officers who wore these funny hats instead of these funny hats. No, they're talking about, in general, loitering, not okay. 
but they weren't thinking about, you know, specifically in a modern context, how these police officers necessarily move through the world, uh, what they will look like, what all that will look like. And so going based off of the intention from a long time ago does have consequences, and I'm not saying that it's not important, but it also manifests itself in how laws are interpreted and how they change. And so another point that was frequently brought up on the floor is that um, the letter of the law can be changed, whereas the spirit of the law, that's just kind of like how people feel and things like that. The spirit of the law isn't just how people feel. If we refer back to the framing, which we spent so many hours on, uh, it is a less strict interpretation of the literal wording of any law based on the deeper meaning or reason for its implementation. Spirit of the law is not just feelings, it's not just vibes. It is an interpretation that's a little bit looser than the adherence to, the, to only the liter literal letter of the law. Both do not have to be different things. They coincide. But the problem with this debate is that we are trying to find, we're trying to define must and take priority over. Those are two really important key words here. Because yes, these two things go hand in hand, and I firmly believe that you cannot divorce the two. You, you cannot decouple the two. However, when we're talking about taking priority, taking priority, there is not only a moral imperative there, but it is, there is a very important framing of like when faced with a crisis, when faced with change, to only look at the letter of the law first is to ignore decades of unbalanced representation of the court. It is to ignore the subjectivity of human perspective and the very fact that laws themselves are dynamic and changing. It is ignoring the fact that when new problems arise, the letter of the law can be inflexible. It is ignoring the fact that just because something hasn't existed before doesn't mean that we shouldn't regulate it, that we shouldn't think about it. And to this end, I want to talk about unenumerated rights. Because the Constitution doesn't say we have a right to debate in this room. I don't even think the Philadelphia Constitution says that, but there's no right there. However, we have a right to free speech. And so the spirit of that is that in this room, we do not leave our right to free speech at the door. We bring it in, and we are able to engage in debate. And wherever that happens, it happens. Right? Because that is a right enumerated in the Constitution. But it doesn't specifically say the philodemic room. And so we're taking the spirit and implementing it in a way that makes the most sense. First of all, we are talking about common sense laws here. We are talking about bringing in the deeper meaning of what free speech is and the fact that it can manifest itself in any space because we are all citizens and these are the rights that we are granted. Next point. You know, somebody talked about whether, you know, when the spirit and the letter are both oppressive, and that's true. I agree. I think there are a lot of cases, especially, you know, there's a very polarized society. It's gotten increasingly worse in a lot of ways. There are going to be times where both the spirit and the letter are going to be kind of on the same side. However, the beauty of the spirit of the law is that it's much more flexible, and that it allows for that to change. Whereas with the letter of the law, you have to go through the process of amending the Constitution, of creating new legislation. But with the spirit, not everybody's spirit is the same. Not everybody's belief in how the law was intended to be carried out is the same. And so when we're comparing the two, because again, we're talking about take priority over, we do have to consider the fact that spirit, at the end of the day, is going to be a lot more flexible and provide a lot more leeway to understanding, to taking into account context, to taking into account people's situations, people's lived experiences, and that's something that I wish we discussed on the floor more. And to be honest, I don't believe that the affirmation has successfully responded to it. I don't think they've told us why context doesn't matter. And I challenge you to do that, because yes, we have the literal wording and we can adhere to it, but they're really framing us as just kind of going off of vibes, when at the end of the day, we're just having a little bit of a looser interpretation so that when other problems arise, we can connect it to the spirit of the law. And we can apply the letter of the law as we see fit. Who's we? All of us, right? All of us matter. And the only reason these laws mean anything is because we put our faith in them and we believe in them. And so to, to kind of close out, I think it's really important to think about justice here, but I also think it's very important to think about understanding and to think about how perspective matters, context matters, and the affirmation has a burden here of proving to us that at the end of the day, none of that is as important as following the literal wording regardless of what it means. Is that how we want to rule a country? Is that how we want to move through the world? Is that how we want to treat people? By not considering their lived experiences? And so I urge you all 
to stand on litigation today. I hope we've successfully convinced you. Um, I'm going to quote my favorite League Week Blonde quote because I really hate to quote this. <laughs> Y'all will remember Aristotle's famous quote, the law is reason free from passion. This theory makes the point that the law is only based on reason. That's what Ellen Woods talked about. She's like, no offense, Aristotle, but you know, I'm very passionate about the law. Um, yeah, and with every theory, it's undermined by its, pre by its premise. The law is not only based on reason, but it's based on precedent, precedent, it's based on necessity, it's based on desire. No decision is made without these factors included in it. That is the truth. And so I urge you all to negate today, because if you stand on the side of justice, if you stand on the side of understanding, you stand on innovation. Thank you. Good job. Good job.